there's about 100 different species found around the globe, and the California red is the largest species of all. Monterey is right in the middle of its natural geographic range. Well, the first real abalone fishermen, and really the first abalone divers, were the native people, the Indian people of Monterey, who were the Rumsian people. And we know that because of burials coming out of the ground in recent years, because a lot of the males have what's known as surfer's ear, which is little bony growth that grow over the opening of your ear if you're spending a lot of time in the cold water of the Monterey Bay. Abalone played a very important part of their life. So they ate it, they used the shells to make tools like fish hooks and shovels and bowls, they used the shells to decorate baskets, to make jewelry. It was beautiful, you know, that iridescent color. Native people from all over the United States were using, getting abalone shells, mostly from California, to put into their regalia and their clothing that they're wearing. And abalone, as I said, played a very important part of their life. Well, it, its appeal as a food item is how delicious it is. It has a kind of it's a cross between veal and lobster, and it has a, a really nice white meat that has a kind of a nutty flavor, depending upon how it's cooked. It's, uh, it's delicious, and it's something that's uh, highly prized everywhere, every culture. The Japanese love it, and, and in other cultures they eat it raw, and they have a lot of ways of preparing it, and it's very, very important to them. It's people who are of uh, Asian descent know what abalone is. They've eaten it all their lives. Many Americans are exposed to it only on the west coast of uh, California where it's available. The wharf is historic in itself. And I think it is one of the oldest commercial working wharfs in the state of California. Abalone fishery began right here in Monterey, or at least the commercial abalone fishery. Well, abalone as a food item for Westerners really didn't take off until the turn of the century. No one quite understood what to do with it. I mean, it was Japanese divers that came here in the 1890s uh, that saw this incredible abundance of abalone in the bay out there. In fact, it was described in letter as being a carpet of abalone. Uh, and nobody's doing anything with it. And the reason nobody is doing anything with it because nobody knew, I mean, what the heck you're supposed to do with it. Uh, but the a Japanese were dealing with abalone for centuries. They did know what to do with it. And they were gathering it. They were diving for it, originally with ama divers, free divers, uh, little white cotton outfits, no, no breathing apparatuses. Uh, and then helmet divers came with the big heavy brass helmets and the canvas suits. And uh, so there were, by 1920, there were nine different companies operating off this wharf here. Uh, and they would go out for three days at a time in the spring, in the summer. A diver would go into the water about 9 o'clock in the morning. He'd be down there till 12 o'clock gathering abalone. Uh, and then he'd come up at 12, have lunch. At 1 o'clock, he'd go back down and then gather more abalone. Then each boat would come in after those three days with about 150 to 200 dozen large red abalone. Uh, and then there were processing plants here on the wharf, again, mostly all Japanese, right here in Monterey. He had initially shipping it to Asia, mainly to Japan, but also to China, to Hawaii and Australia because that's where the market was for it. Mostly in California, no one quite understood what to do with it. I mean, they tried different ways to cook it. They actually put lies on it to soften it up a little bit, and they'd bake it. It was still pretty tough. So it wasn't until a German restaurateur named Popper and Dalter, who came to Monterey in 1907, actually opened his first restaurant on Alvarado Street, uh, and, and was fascinated with this abalone thing. Couldn't figure out why nobody was eating it. Um, so he brought it to his restaurant, began to experiment with it, and finally came up with this famous recipe where you slice the foot, because that's what you're eating when you're eating abalone, is the foot. Pound it to make it nice and soft, and he'd run it through egg wash, cracker crumbs, and cook it up quickly in olive oil or butter. And he, soon people came from all over to eat fresh abalone steaks in his restaurant. Uh, 
actually a pretty good sized restaurant. In fact, there were two restaurants in the building. There was a, a, a lower level that catered to the working class, upper level that catered to the hotel, a hotel Del Monte class, the rich class, and the abalone steaks, abalone stews. Uh, he used to sell, serve the stew in the shell. It felt the holes of the shell with lead. Um, abalone salads, and he was known for the abalone. He, be, he was world famous for the abalone. I mean, everywhere people would come to his restaurant to eat it when they came to Monterey. People would pack his restaurant. Uh, they would sing songs and write poetry about abalone. Like some folks boast the quail on toast because they think it's Tony, but I'm content to owe my rent and live on abalone. George Sterling wrote that in his guest books in 1913. Monterey Bay was the epicenter for abalone uh, in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, in 1929, uh, almost a million dollars in revenue was brought in, 75% of it right here in Monterey. There used to be a very bountiful fishery of wild abalone and we didn't know much about the biology and essentially we overfished them beyond numbers that they could sustain their next generation. So in 1997, the California Department of Fish and Game completely closed the commercial fishery in the state waters. In California, we have seven species. Um, all of them are at some level of protection these days. So there was a point in time, it wasn't very long ago, that you used to be able to go down to the rocks at low tide and pop these things off with tire irons. And it's what the poor man ate because he couldn't afford to buy steaks. So with the fishery closed, it obviously opened the door for operations like Monterey Abalone Company. what's called cage culture underneath this wharf. We uh, feed them a diet of giant kelp, mainly, and other mixed algae, mostly reds. We're a very unique abalone farm, as farms go. We're utilizing the infrastructure of a existing municipal wharf. So our farm is built underneath the wharf, provides shade for the abalone, which is a good thing for the abs, we're basically in the open ocean. We're not in an enclosed marina, which would be a high risk. You have to look at our farm to understand that that was completely unoccupied, unusable space before we set up. How else could that space be used is anyone's guess, uh, but we certainly utilize it and, uh, and it's a real special place in my heart. And, and so uh, here I am farming abalone and bringing it back to the dinner table. It's a very creative use of space. Really all the abalone live under the wharf in space that would otherwise be not be usable for anybody, let alone a business. It's, it's very unique and creative in that way. And then as an aquaculture facility, you know, it's, it's really fulfilling a, a, a niche in the seafood market. And uh, we are just really you know, proud of them, frankly, that they have done this in such a sustainable and clean manner. Both in the kelp harvesting they do very carefully and by hand and uh, run a real clean operation under the wharf. 
and create uh, you know what is really a, just a fabulous product. And uh, we have a lease with uh, the Abalone Company, and one of the things that we provide is security. We have both 24-hour uh, person presence, and also we have a, a multiple camera system that surveys the area. Not many cities, I think, would take the chance to, to do something like this. It was really forward thinking. We have a wonderful tidal surge here, and it keeps the water uh, fresh and clean and oxygenated and helps the abalone to really grow. So it's been here well over 20 years. It's something that's been very successful. It's something that uh, is sustainable. We tried from the beginning to make uh, the business work like Mother Nature. We feed the abalone exactly what they eat. Uh, we keep them in the water that they live in ordinarily. There's nothing added, there's no steroids. The abalone don't grow really fast. It takes a long time, about an inch a year for them to grow. Uh, but our business has been successful. I want everybody to know that this is a great thing that's happened here and the people that are working here today are keeping alive a tradition of Monterey being a center for uh, red abalone and you go to local restaurants you can still eat abalone and this is why. Really since it was constructed, both the wharf and the warehouse building in 1926, it's centered around uh, commercial fishing. And overall, the city of Monterey has been very supportive of its, of its commercial and recreational fishing industries for, for many, many years. It's really part of the culture of this community and extremely important to the larger tourism economy. People want to see the fishing boats. They want to eat fresh local seafood.